Sorry. <laughs> Hi, we're back. We're going to do our last segment, which is going to be on claim preclusion and issue preclusion. Join us. All right, claim preclusion versus issue preclusion. Claim preclusion, also known as? Restitution. Very good, restitution. And issue preclusion, also known as collateral estoppel. Um, for your own purposes, um, you're probably better off just using the terms issue preclusion and claim preclusion and much less likely to get confused. So I'll try to just use these terms and if I Slip, my apologies. Claim preclusion. The elements we did in class just a week or two ago, right? Same claim. Valid final judgment on the merits. And same parties or critics. All right, let's talk about each of these elements just a little bit. Same claim. All right, now there's a bunch of tests that are noted in your case book, right? Like the, uh, the same right, you know, this, that, and the other. Well, the main one we're focusing on in class here is the transactional test, right? Under Restatement Section 24, which is very similar to the TRO standard we've discussed uh, multiple times throughout the year, and, you know, of course, multiple times today. Transactional test is going to look to the evidence, like the time frame, and you're yet in another scenario where you're asking, um, is one thing sufficiently like another? Now, the same claim requirement means that if you have lawsuit number one and lawsuit number two, well, you ask whether the claim to lawsuit number two is the same one as lawsuit number one, right? Under claim preclusion, under the same claim requirement, it doesn't have to be the same legal theory in both cases, at least under the transactional test, right? Under the transactional test, for example, suit number one, you sue somebody for negligence, for running a car into you. And then in suit number two, you sue them for battery, for running a car into you, the same incident, right? Well, under the transactional test, that's going to be the same claim. Now, maybe under some of the other theories of claim preclusion, it would not be, right? Another example, suit number one, you sue somebody for negligence for causing damage to your car, right? Suit number two, you sue that same person for the same car wreck, but now you're suing not for the damage to the car, but rather to your bodily injuries, right? Under some theories of uh, claim preclusion, right, the primary right, but those wouldn't be the same claim. But under transactional tests, they're going to be the same claim, right? Because in both these hypotheticals, the transaction at issue is, is the car accident, right? So even if you sue and suit one for negligence, suit two for battery, it's the same transaction at issue. If you sue and suit one for damage to the car, and suit number two for damage to your person, it's still the same transaction, right? The same conduct, same stuff that happened. And under the transaction test, suit number two is going to be barred. Okay? So that teaches us an important additional thing about the, the, the same claim requirement. When all the three, these three elements are met, we have what is called merger and bar. So if in suit one you sue the defendant for negligence, right, for hurting your car, and then in suit number two you sue them, sue them for battery for hurting your person, but it's from the same transaction, we're using the transactional test, right? Well, on the doctrine of merger and bar, here's what's going to happen. Once suit number two gets to a valid final judgment on the merits, it goes, rewind. Once suit number one gets to a valid final judgment on the merits, then that judgment is going to have merger and bar. And that judgment for negligence against the car is going to merge together, not just with the theories asserted, the damages asserted, but also any theories or damages that weren't asserted that arise from the same transaction. <laughs> so we have this judgment for negligence for the car, right? And guess what? Merging into that is not, in merging into that judgment, is not just the theories that were asserted, but also any theories of damages that weren't. And then bar means you are now barred from asserting that claim again, right? Merger and bar. 
All right, same claim. Uh, valid final judgment of <coughs> on the merits. All right, uh, a default judgment can be a judgment on the merits, right? A final valid judgment on the merits, so long as there was PJ, right? As long as PJ uh, exists, then um, there's going to be a valid final judgment on the merits. A 12 v 6 dismissal with prejudice can be a valid final judgment on the merits. Um, a summary judgment can be a valid final judgment on the merits. So you don't have to have a jury trial to have a valid final judgment on the merits. Of course, a jury trial, at least, or jury verdict, the judge enters judgment, also valid uh, a final judgment on uh, the merits. You have a trial where the court grants a directed verdict and enters judgment for the defendant, also a valid final judgment on the merits. Now keep in mind that in the federal system, or speaking generally rather, speaking generally, uh, a judgment is final even if it's on appeal. So for res judicata purposes, the, uh, 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 the judgment and the first adjudication can be given preclusionary effect even if there, there's a pending uh, appeal. Um, same parties or privies, you know, we didn't really spend much time on that. Same parties, you know, fact pattern tells you it was uh, Sally sues Bob in suit number one, there's a valid final judgment on the merits, and suit number two is all, again, between Sally versus uh, Bob. You have the same parties, that's easy. Privies is when one or both parties are different, right? But there's a sufficient relationship between the past and the present parties. Uh, the relationship or other facts indicate we're going to treat them as being the same. So, for example, suit number one is by Bob, okay? But then Bob dies, and then suit number two is by Sally, who's Bob's executor, right? Well, Sally is Bob's executor, um, would be the one in charge of any claims belonging to the state. They would be in privity with uh, one another. Um, other examples of privity could be on the landowner, right? Say a um, a lien. You, you guys probably know way more about this than me. You say like you know there's there's a case involving a lien on a property and it's litigated between um, a, a, a one property owner and another, right? And later the property owner sells to different people, right? Well, unless I'm getting my property law wrong, um, the successive owners of the land should be in privity with the prior owners, and that prior judgment should bind uh, the later um, buyers, the later, later landowners. Okay, so uh, claim preclusion. Uh, there are some exceptions to claim preclusion, which were noted in the reading. Uh, one big one is uh, some states will not give preclusionary effect to a judgment if the original court, the rendering court, was not able to hear that claim. There was a lack of subject matter jurisdiction, right? The court lacked uh, jurisdictional uh, competency. Uh, what else? Ah, and another thing worth quoting, I'll just note this very briefly. Now, let's get our terminology right. We got the court that reaches judgment first is the rendering court, and the court that may or may not give exclusionary effect later on is the um, enforcing court. All right. When the enforcing court is determining whether to give res judicato effect, all right, this is going to be because of the full faith and credit, right? If it's a state court, then it's the full faith and credit clause and the full faith and credit statute. If it's federal court, enforcing a state court judgment, then it's the full faith and credit statute. But what the enforcing court is going to do is the enforcing court will give inclusionary effect, the same inclusionary effect as would have been given by the rendering court, right? So say we're in court one is in Florida, and court two is a state court in Pennsylvania, all right? Pennsylvania court will not ask about the preclusion principles of Pennsylvania courts. Instead, because the Pennsylvania court is being asked to give preclusionary effect to the render judgment from a Florida court, the Pennsylvania court is going to have to determine the preclusionary principles used by the rendering court and apply those principles later on. 
Now the idea here is under full faith and credit, the preclusionary effect of any judgment should be given the same effect in this state or any other state, right? So if the enforcing court is Pennsylvania, use Florida preclusion principles. If the enforcing court is Ohio, use Florida preclusion principles. All right, the last subject we're gonna cover is issue preclusion. Also known as collateral stop. Now here, the elements are same issue, that issue must be actually litigated, There must be a full and fair opportunity to litigate. The issue must be actually decided. It must be necessary to the judgment. And then I'm going to put down in brackets the issue of mutuality. All right. Now, issue preclusion can be a lot broader than claim preclusion because issue preclusion goes towards the smaller chunks of, of cases, right? It could be a factual issue, who's driving the car? It could be a legal issue, um, what is, hmm, hmm. I'm trying to think of a good example. Well, a factual issue, who's driving the car, a mixed question of fact or law, was there personal jurisdiction over the defendant in an earlier case? Things like that. Smaller bits of cases, fact, law, or combination thereof. All right, brain freeze on that one. All right, so it's going to be the same issue between both cases. And that means you can have lawsuits that involve completely different claims. But one party can be precluded from relitigating an issue that the parties had actually litigated and that was decided earlier on. It's got to be the same issue. Now it's got to be something that's actually litigated in the earlier uh, adjudication. And that's important. Compare claim preclusion. In claim preclusion, you have merger or bar, right? Which means we're going to preclude not just theories or damages that were actually asserted, but ones that were never asserted at all. Merger or bar means you can't raise them at all later on. For issue preclusion, in a sense, it's a little bit narrower because we only have preclusion of issues that were actually litigated. Full and fair opportunity, we've talked about that a couple times, right? Think of things like, did the procedural rules give the included party the opportunity to litigate the issue? Were they able to actually issue, act, 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 able to litigate? Things like that. Actually decided, all right? Actually decided means we have something we can look at to show that this issue was decided. It might be a court opinion. It might be a, a special verdict form from a jury. It might be fact findings from the judge, so on and so forth. It might be other papers, but we need something to look at to show that the issue was actually decided. If we don't have any papers, all we have is a general verdict. Then these two would collapse into one, but I'm not gonna get into that right now. But one element is actually decided. The next element is that the issue decided must be necessary to the decision. And this is to make sure that the fact finder put enough effort into making a good decision and it wasn't just a uh, spurious decision that it gave less attention or thought to. Now here, what I'm going to point you towards specifically is the handout we did just last Monday, not this Monday, or the, uh, the, it was last Wednesday, we could go Wednesday, um, on the various contributory negligence scenarios, right? And when you're doing the analysis of necessity, you gotta engage in a logical analysis, right? Was the issue that was decided one that affects the change of the result of the judgment? And this I am not gonna get into, because re-explaining this one would require first pulling up the handout, and second would probably take about half an hour to do. We don't have the time for that, so I'm just gonna move on. So the last final issue here is the somewhat abandonment of the mutuality requirement. It used to be that you couldn't have issue preclusion unless both cases involved the same parties or their privies. 
But a couple of Supreme Court cases um, have made it clear to federal courts, at least, that if they want, they can allow issue preclusion non-mutually. Now, I'm going to give you the big picture. Look at it here, and then you go back and look at the handout, because there's that nice little uh, box grid that we talked about in class along with the problem set. The big idea to always keep in your mind when you think about non-mutual preclusion against whom is preclusion asserted, all right? Is the person who's being stuck with preclusion, is that person somebody who wasn't a part of your privy in the first suit? If the answer to that question is yes, then no issue preclusion. Why? Because it's unfair to have preclusion against somebody who wasn't in that first suit, either as a party or as, as the privy. It would violate due process. See footnote seven of uh, the Park Lane case. I believe it's footnote seven. All right. On the other hand, if the person against whom preclusion is being asserted was a party in the prior suit, right, or a privy, somebody litigated that issue and lost on that issue, right, then it might be okay, right. Now, if you're asserting preclusion um, defensively, the Supreme Court says, ask, make sure you're asking whether there was a full and fair opportunity in the prior suit for the person being precluded. If it's being used offensively, not as a shield, like Captain America opened in the theaters last night, but a sword, okay, then additional precautions have to be taken, right? And the court looks at things like, are there prior and consistent um, adjudications? Uh, were there procedural differences in the prior adjudication um, that made a difference? Uh, did the plaintiff um, sit on their hands and wait for suit number one to be finished before uh, filing suit number two, and so on, and so forth. So, um, the only other topic we discussed this, this semester uh, is appeals. We covered that just two days ago. I refer you to the uh, problem set in the book. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to stop the camera, we'll take a short break, and then we'll get back together for something else. Let me stop the camera. And that's it.